Hello and very well. Welcome to the brand new edition of Policy Watch. I'm Kriti Mishra. Today we'll take a closer look at two important topics. Air cargo policy in the offing and revised CBSC affiliation bylaws. But first up, the topic of air cargo policy. The government will soon come out with an air cargo policy. The aim is to provide thrust to air cargo, fuel growth of aviation sector and boost country's economy. Civil Aviation Minister Suresh Prabhu has said that in night hours when air passenger traffic is negligible, it could be used for cargo. Total air cargo at all Indian airports during 2016-17 witnessed a growth of 9.3%. And for more on this, I'm joined by Mrs. Vanna Agarwal, Economic Advisor, Ministry of Civil Aviation, and by Mr. K.A. Badrinath, Editor Policy, Financial Chronicle. Welcome to Ratsabha Television, both of you. Coming to you first, ma'am. India's air cargo industry has to grow at around 13% to realize the vision of a national civil aviation policy to achieve the target of 10 million tons by the year 2027. How important is this comprehensive policy and when do we see it in the public domain? Um, the air cargo policy is under advanced stage of development. We have already held a series of stakeholder consultations in small groups and in some of the regions. Presently, we are in discussion with the different departments and ministries for their comments. And uh, it should be on the website for stakeholder consultations, open stakeholder consultations in the coming month. By 15th November, it should certainly be up. Right, right. Mr. Badrinath, can you please elucidate a bit more on the concept of cargo villages touted to be very crucial for air cargo industry? See, the air cargo policy, as Man Agarwal was saying, it was part of the original aviation policy that was already approved by the Union Cabinet. And air cargo policy in specific, perhaps uh, the government has felt is, it was required for the simple reason that it has a lot of economic impact that is going to make. One, uh, Make in India program can get a big boost because of the cargo policy. Second issue is that uh, in a competitive world, perhaps uh, somewhere down the line, aviation sector will have to compete with other modes of transport. Today you don't have just uh, uh, by travel by air or uh, you know uh, transport your cargo by air and that kind of stuff. You take it by road, you take it by shipping, you take it by air. So point here is, you're there is here now the more of a, a unified policy of you know multimodal transport policy. In that uh, background, cargo movement through air for quickness, for the fastness with which you want to send it across both domestically as well as internationally, perhaps is going to be very big uh, issue. Second is possibility is that you can even generate a lot of jobs through the yes. cargo policy cargo movement or cargo as an economic enterprise. Right. So my guess is that uh, maybe she will tell you better. My point here is the third, uh, I also think that, uh, you know, um, uh, you are talking about uh, the Mr. Suresh Prabhu saying that, okay, night hours can be used for uh, cargo movement. Yes, definitely most of our airports are underutilized, except yes. for the busy ones, metro airports. So that is a possibility and that could be done. Ma'am, the government has unveiled several measures uh, for this industry. For <coughs> instance, 24-7 custom clearance at 13 airports. There's also single window clearance by the custom department. But how will this policy remove the bottlenecks of freight movement and logistics? The cargo policy, of course, I'm not uh, totally authorized to talk about the forthcoming elements, but mm -hmm. let me just relate them to the national civil aviation policy, which Badri also mentioned. There is a paragraph 20 on air cargo policy, which sets out the broad spectrum in which it would be worked out. But in the last few years, we have <coughs> seen cataclysmic changes in the Indian economy and growing on the strength of that economy as well as other drivers which we are seeing for air cargo, we thought it is opportune time to use those uh, drivers and to come out with a new initiative, which is whole of the trade value chain, rather than just focusing on 
air cargo as it translates from out of airports. So right. that is one of the uh, answers I would have for your question. That is the focus only then on airports and the air connectivity from them, the major airports that are there. The, the second thing is that if you look at of airport facilities. We are encouraging air freight stations, which also comes out from yes. uh, the air cargo policy. The issue of cargo villages or actually regional hubs, whether they are in the northeast, whether they are in other agri zones, whether they are across the 300 odd supply clusters, uh, industrial supply uh, clusters that we have. Consumer growth is also driving air cargo. What we are trying to do in the new air cargo policy is to harness these trends, to build on what the drivers are bringing out, uh, the, in, the, the impetus from those drivers, and mm -hmm. then to come out with something which is um, backed by ease of doing business, which is another governmental initiative, right. which draws strength from landmark initiatives like Make in India, Startup India. In aviation, we are doing startup aviation. Yes. Uh, then you, of course, have various investment initiatives, the exim policy initiatives. We are also trying to leverage uh, the air service agreements, which have typically been used for uh, passenger movements. So we would like to see how we can propel cargo. Uh, movement as well through these. Right, absolutely. Mr. Badrinath, how can this policy make India more competitive in the global air cargo space? If you want me to be very frank, we are very nascent in terms of, you know, a cargo industry is development in this country besides if you take you know destinations like Europe and US. Uh, my guess is we have a long way to go. The potential is there. How well we harvest this is a key challenge. And secondly, there are a lot of bottlenecks that uh, you talked about. Uh, well, for example, do we have a separate cargo infrastructure to handle a huge movement of goods and services? Second is, uh, there is concept of you know, cargo villages that yes. are you know, uh, developed uh, with uh, m most of the major airports. Do we have uh, separate cargo villages? Can we have a pilot project on that? Third is uh, point of, you know, I don't, um, can we rate different cargo terminals in terms of best of the practices that have they are, uh, you know, uh, adopting? If this is, uh, these are the issues which uh, need to be, you know, imbibed into the policy that ma'am is trying to put together. Ma'am, so how will you assuage his concerns? The yes, issue please. with Badri on some of those, mm -hmm. for instance. I don't think that the Indian cargo is actually, air cargo is actually at a nascent stage. What we have achieved in the past few years shows that we are competing now with the best among the world. And I will in, uh, draw attention to some of the initiatives which actually are the first of their kind in the world that India has taken. For instance, in air freight, India has established the world's first air freight corridor between Afghanistan and India. That is between Kabul and Delhi and Kabul and Mumbai. Kabul and uh, Amritsar has also begun flights uh, or dedicated cargo, air freight cargo. We have, for the first time, a digital freight cargo, which is supposed to encourage and promote ease of doing business and reduce the d dwell time that you were speaking about, and thereby also reduce costs between Mumbai and Skipol Airport. So it's a dedicated e-freight corridor, which is being developed for the first time in the world between any two airports, which are cross country. We have brought out uh, two we meaning India has brought out two digital booking platforms in air cargo for the first time. One of them is called, this is all in the private sector. So they are realizing the potential and the competitiveness of the air cargo or air freight space. Otherwise, why would private initiative come up to develop these two portals? So just as you and I sit in our houses and book a, a ticket through Make My Trip or Yatra.com. So today potentially, and an air cargo can be booked out of any village in India using the cargo ego 
or a Rigel cargo platform. Mm -hmm. The only thing is that people have to get used to it. And these are the first in the kind in the world. Right. Thank you for those highlights, ma'am. But also the fact that India produces more than 400 million tons of horticulture products mm -hmm. and 30% of them perish before they reach markets. So how would air cargo be instrumental in ensuring that these items are not perish? Well, we have through this new air cargo policy sought to devise, use actually, um, backbones which are already there, whether they are related to the trans uh, road transport sector, whether it is the postal uh, mail, which has been, uh, and courier system. So to set up aggregations and consolidation of cargo and then to bring it on to, uh, in a timely manner, into an air freighter or to, into the belly of any cargo plane, uh, of any passenger plane. So we are, we are uh, taking up initiatives to do that. Uh, and of course, in parallel, there is the development of the fully, uh, fully cold chain link, uh, mm -hmm. the cold chain storages, the packing houses. We are in touch actually with suppliers. So it's actually, uh, as I said, it's end to end uh, contact. We've held um, conferences in the Northeast, for instance, and you would be happy to hear that from Tripura, the first queen pineapple mm -hmm. was airshipped just a few months ago. Oh, wonderful! To to the international levels, uh, to the international market, the first lychees from uh, Samastipur and Mughal Sarai were simply airlifted straight by forming the straight uh, supply chain and these were also internationally sent. So there are initiatives in the horticultural, in the agricultural space that we are focusing on. Right. You want to question, sir? Yeah. Uh, uh, I'm sure she is doing a lot of it. Uh, uh, when I say the potential, the potential is so huge, so huge. What we are doing is like a drop in the ocean. One is because of, uh, you know, uh, the kind of business that we can do through air cargo movement is so huge. Even the 10 million tons that you're talking about by 2027 or something, I'm sure we'll not be able to do it. With the kind of growth that you're, uh, I know, uh, posting right now, you need at least certain percent. You are not able to do that. Yes, ma'am. We've I'm achieved sorry. in the last four years 10.1% CAGR already. Even and then it will be 7%, ma'am. This is All on right, the so back. 7 million tons. Express cargo is growing at 17%. So if you put the whole thing together, I think we will more than achieve. Uh, Absolutely. The so target. the picture is bright <laughs> and potential is huge. On no. that note, thank you so much for joining us. So this policy will boost trade and economy of the country. Time for a short break. Stay tuned. Lots more on the other side. Welcome back, you're watching Policy Watch. Now we'll take a closer look at the revised CBSE affiliation bylaws. The bylaws have been completely revamped to ensure speed, transparency and ease of doing business with the CBSE. Schools will now be required to submit only two documents for affiliation instead of 14 documents submitted earlier. And the entire process will be online. Inspection of schools will now be outcome based. And for more on this, I'm joined by Dr. Jyoti Gupta, CBSE representative, and by Mr. Arunab Singh, director, Nehru World School, Ghazabad. Welcome to Ratsabha Television, both of you. Coming to you, Dr. Gupta, first. More than 20,000 schools of CBSE in India and in 25 other countries, around 1.9 crore students and 10 lakh teachers. Certainly, these changes are very important. So what are the salient features of the revised bylaws? So the revised bylaws are a very welcome change because the uh, the stress of CBSC is now going to be on uh, auditing the quality of the schools. That is what kind of uh, qualitative work are the uh, schools doing, uh, the uh, capacity building of the teachers, what kind of teachers are there, are they uh, transacting the curriculum properly or not. Earlier, where the entire stress was on the infrastructure and on the NOCs that were obtained from the state. So, uh, the CBSC was actually going through all those papers and uh, granting the affiliation to the schools. 
Though yes, there was a check on uh, uh, whether the curriculum is being transacted, whether the NCRT books are being used, etc. But then there was uh, just the, just about that. So now with the uh, new bylaws, where uh, instead of going to uh, the <coughs> state twice, that is. Uh, both for the 10th and the 12th now it is possible to grant the composite affiliation also and also uh, there uh, whatever work has to be done by the state in terms of because it is a concurrent subject right. and it is the state's responsibility to check on the safety and the security of the infrastructure that is provided by the uh, you know private players so uh, the cbsc once it has been granted by the state will accept it as it is and will stress more upon the quality in the schools while granting the affiliation. Absolutely. Mr. Singh, also the fact that the simplified system will ensure ease of doing business with the CBSC, but how will it prevent duplication of process? Uh, it will pro prevent duplication of process in a simple way, like uh, Dr. Gupta just said. Uh, the state takes care of infrastructure. CBSC comes in and actually talks about what are you doing in your engine room. They're not bothered about anything else anymore because the state has already taken uh, cognizance of that and they've given those approvals. Uh, and if you read those uh, affiliation bylaws, uh, some beautiful things come out of these bylaws now which weren't there earlier. For example, the first teacher that gets talked about is a physical education teacher. The second teacher gets talked about is a special educator. Now these were not stress areas for CBSE affiliation. Uh, it was what does the block look like? Is it painted or not? So uh, I think it's just basically getting streamlined and, and that's what should have been happening for a long time. He's talking about streamlining the process. There's another very important component and which is a fee. So the bylaws say that there has to be full disclosure of fee and there no extra charge could be levied in the GABA fee. That would surely be a huge breather for the students and the parents alike. See, it was already there also. Now, CBSC had uh, left it open by saying that, uh, uh, you know, the uh, fee should commensurate with the facilities that have been given by the school. But now in the new bylaws, again, the fee is left onto the states because, again, it is a state subject. Mm -hmm. And each of the states today have an ordinance. They have an act. Uh, you know, like UP had an ordinance. Now they have an act. And there is an education act in almost all the states. So the fee is anyways regulated by the, uh, by the state. And uh, CBSC, in fact, has very little role uh, to play where the fee is concerned. Mm -hmm. So in the new bylaws, they have clearly laid this down now. Earlier it was open. Mr. Singh, these changes clearly lay emphasis on mandatory teachers training. How important is that element? A school cannot be better than the quality of teachers in it. So if we are starting to put the teacher training at the center of it, you could not have a better policy than this. If the teacher is not getting trained, then not only are students not learning better, but these people are also you know, getting stagnated and your newer talent is not as motivated to come into the profession. So uh, teacher training has to have a huge push. In fact, I would say when you read uh, the new affiliation bylaws and it says we are looking at learning outcomes. So in this, the second affiliation uh, inspection that a CBSC would do three years hence is actually going to be even more important than the first one. Because when I'm going to CBSC for the first time, I have just come till grade eight. I do not have a CBSC board result. So you can come in, you can have a look at how my classes are going or what my lesson plans look like, but I really don't have a, a track record, so to say. But when you come back to me three years hence, I would have had a track record of what kind of teacher trainings have I done, uh, how have those teacher trainings actually impacted pedagogy. So uh, this is brilliant news for schools that are wanting to do good work. I would like to say here that capacity building of the teachers is extremely important. So uh, the teachers, when they come to the school, they come from various backgrounds. So it's important for the teachers to unlearn and relearn. So CBSC earlier uh, never stressed upon the uh, training of the teachers. In fact, uh, when CCE came in as a concept that was beautiful, the continuous and comprehensive evaluation, 
um, you know, the assessments as were defined, uh, you know, uh, in the um, CCE were actually like the assessments that are done all over the world. But the implementation of CCE was not, uh, uh, you know, I would say uh, perfect. That is because the capacity building of the teachers was not done. Right. How to transact in the classes, then how to assess the children. Uh, though there were training programs, there were master trainer programs, but it wasn't mandatory. So if there is anything that is not mandatory and that actually, um, you know, calls for spending some money from the managements, people did not do the training. But now with the centers of excellence in place and uh, equal stress being laid on five days mandatory training of every CBSE school, uh, teacher, I think a lot of quality will also come in. Right. Now, all the international boards, whether it is <coughs> IB or it is IGCSC, um, you know, there is uh, so much being talked about the international boards and the quality of these boards. It is all because of the professional development of the teachers that is there as a mandate per year. Right. So I think uh, with this coming in, both, uh, you know, uh, being the representative of uh, the board uh, who was, uh, um, you know, a part of uh, the uh, governing body when, uh, you know, this decision was taken. Yes. Uh, to, you know, even as a working school who has been a working principal with yes. the board for a long time. I think it is a very, very welcome move. In the, in the previous format, there were certain school managements who would feel threatened in getting their teachers trained or they would fear what will happen if I train and this teacher leaves. While even back then they should have been more concerned with what will happen if I don't train and this teacher stays. But now that option has been taken away from the school management. Mm -hmm. So while there were some good schools or many good schools who were laying more stress or still laying more stress and five days of teacher training would probably not even be 10% of the total teacher training that they're already doing. Mm. But these schools who did not have this as a central idea, they will be forced to invest in their teachers. Absolutely. That's a very important point. Also, ma'am, there's this category of innovative schools yes. or specialized schools. Yes. Can you please shed more light on that? Uh, so all these schools that are doing uh, more innovation, like uh, uh, there is one category of schools which will do only what is mandated. Uh, but there is another category of schools which would, you know, go out of their way, get innovations and uh, stretch the, themselves and their teachers in order to bring newer things for the children and also motivate the children to do the innovations. So mm -hmm. the, the stress is being like what Arunab said was, uh, uh, you know, once the affiliation is granted, then every three years there is a provision of uh, re-affiliation. So re-affiliation would be granted to the schools which are innovating. So uh, along with whatever are the mandatory things they're doing that, but also uh, the schools which are innovators, bringing newer technology, you know, not, not only in terms of technology, science and technology, but also in the form of, uh, you know, health and physical education, in the form of co-curricular, um, uh, in the curriculum because we don't call them extra curriculars anymore. Right. So there has to be art in education. So mm -hmm. whether it is visual art or it is performing arts, there has to be sports in education. So all this is going to be a part of the, uh, you know, the auditing process whereby they will go check and only then re-affiliate if there is quality work going on in the schools. Right. Last comments from the two of you. Mm. How will these changes make our education system more robust and quality driven? Ma'am, mm. you first. Um, I would say that that is where uh, we need to go because uh, uh, this is not the time for uh, more regulations. Because where the schools are concerned, the only thing that we've been talking about is regulation, regulation and regulation. Right. Now is the time to give uh, or to empower the schools and to see as to what is the level that the schools can go up to. Then set examples and let the other schools follow. Because somewhere the quality has to come into our system. 
So the new uh, laws that have come in, you know, the timelines are changing. Instead of uh, granting affiliations in two years, three years, there are cases which are not cleared for even six years. Now, due to the fast track system, you know, people will get the affiliations in three months, six months. But yes, once the affiliation is granted, they can't sit in peace because three years hence, there's going to be even a more rigorous, right. uh, you know, check on what they are doing. So somewhere I think the quality will come in. And where we talk about CBSC, you know, state boards are different, but CBSC is some one organization which is catering to the diversity of this country. So Absolutely. we have a school in Delhi. We have a school in Mumbai, we have a school in even the remote parts of UP, Bihar, Northeast. So uh, in order to ensure quality, even in these places and parity, it is important that the quality checks be made. Because one board exam, 192% of a Delhi child is equivalent to 92% of a child in Northeast also. Mr. Singh, your take on the quality? So every developed country has got a developed education system where focus has been on qualitative improvement. So how I understand these new bylaws is from a quantitative check. We are starting to talk about a qualitative check. And uh, like many other policies, the implementation of this new format is actually going to be the key. How would you find ways that in one day you summarize how teaching learning is happening in the school? So while the policy construct looks phenomenal, but I would really wait for how would they implement this and make sure they can juice everything that the school has been doing over the past few years in a day. Or perhaps there would be more days spent in school. I would really welcome more days spent in school. Right. So the takeaway is that the new format is going to be the key. Thank you so much for joining us on Rad Television. Well, that's all we have for you in this edition. It's a wrap on this one. Thanks for watching and stay tuned to Rad Television.